Professor Oster, thank you so much for speaking with me today. I'm super excited to talk. So you started a, a tracker called the COVID-19 School Response Dashboard um, to look at not only how many infections we're seeing in schools around the country, but also how infection rates differ based on varying COVID mitigation strategies. Um, so things like mask wearing and distancing. What have you found? First, um, we're for the most part seeing COVID cases uh, varying with community spread. So we're seeing in places where there's higher spread in the community, we're seeing more cases. Um, and some of that, or probably a lot of that, seems to reflect infections that are happening outside um, that are then, you know, people are affiliated with schools. And then when we drill down into, you know, what is associated with differences across schools, uh, one big thing we see is ages. So elementary school kids in particular seem to be lower risk than high school kids. So we're seeing differences there. And then we're seeing um, big differences in masking. So in places where there, where masks are required for everybody, we're seeing much lower rates, and that's particularly true in staff. So staff rates in places with no masking in schools are, are much higher. Now, again, is that because they're not masking in other aspects of their life? Um, that's a little bit unclear, but certainly we see that very, very strongly in the data. Is mask use the mitigation strategy that you guys have found is, is the most effective? It is the thing that shows up with the strongest correlation, um, is, is how I would put it. Um, and, you know, we don't ask about every mitigation strategy you could possibly imagine, but we ask about ventilation and distancing um, and, you know, symptom checking and things like that. And masking is the thing that shows up with the strongest correlation. Right. You're looking at, you know, a lot of different things with this dashboard. What is the most interesting finding to you? When we initially thought about this dashboard, our main question was just how, what do rates look like in schools? We were sort of th thinking about starting this in August when there just w like was very little data. Um, and so I think in some ways, the, the most interesting thing, the most important, the biggest thing that has come out is just this recognition that these school rates are not, uh, are not enormously high, that we're not seeing you know, huge outbreaks um, for, for the most part. Now that we have sort of seen that piece of it, the thing that I'm interested in that I would like to understand better, whether it's a kind of real fact, is we're doing some breakdowns by density. So looking at, um, at schools where a larger share of the kids are in person relative to their sort of typical enrollment. So um, if you think about, you know, a hybrid system where you've got half the kids in at any given time versus a sort of more of a full in-person system, we're actually seeing at the moment the rates in kids who are there, or the rates among kids in schools that are full time, in per, that are that have higher density, are actually lower than the rates um, in schools with more limited density, um, and that is something that I think we need to try to understand better. Why do you think that would be? So um, one possibility is it's just an accident of the data we have now. Um, another possibility has to do with what the kids are doing when they're not at school. So if you think that, you know, when uh, when kids are at school every day, their exposure is home and school. And when kids are at school every other day, their exposure is home, school and the child care that they that they have on the off days. Um, you can imagine that you might see more rates, higher rates in kids because they have more exposures. Yeah, I, I get that. But still, as you said, there's there's more yeah. there's more to learn on that front. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And I think, and, you know, those places, those schools may be in different kinds of places in ways that are hard for us to control. I mean, I as a person whose academic work is all about causality, these kind of correlational statements are sort of like things that are interesting to explore, but are hard to um, hard to really say, OK, that's the that's the thing at this point. When did you start collecting data for the dashboard? Yeah, so um, so this project came about um, because I think I and a bunch of other people were having some of the same thoughts, um, which is, you know, we started to see in August, we started to see some schools open. Um, and actually, many of the early openings were in places like Georgia, Indiana, places which at the time had very high positivity rates. And it felt like um, we were not getting out very consistent information about how those openings were going. We were seeing you know, some reporting about, you know, there are cases here, there's quarantine there, and then some reporting where people are like, oh, actually, everything's great, it's totally fine. Um, and neither of those things is really, you know, data. We started collecting data like the, the 
second week of September, first week of September. Um, I think we started signing people up in August. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was it was kind of fast. Was it hard to get buy in from school districts? It 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 was. Um, so I think, you know, initially um, we got some, we got a lot of school districts that were interested. I think for some of them, the information we were asking about was um, like hard to get. So, you know, asking school districts, like how exactly how many kids, you know, do you have enrolled and in person, like they have that, but to get it for all their schools is, um, is hard. We have had more luck in recent waves with the dashboard, being able to incorporate data from whole states. So sort of subsequent to kind of our initial efforts, some states started doing better reporting on their own. We've been able to pull some of that in, and that has, has proved to be an easier way to get more uniform coverage. So what isn't in the dashboard at this point? Like what are the blind spots in the data that you have? One thing is we definitely have pretty significant geographic blind spots. I think the most significant sort of conceptual blind spot, which is difficult to think about how to fix, is that really what, what people would like to know is how much COVID is spreading in schools. To what extent are people getting it at school? Uh, and what we have is to what extent are people associated with schools, do they have COVID? Which of course is not the same question. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, you can sort of think of what we're saying as kind of like, like an upper bound, but it's a very extreme upper bound in the sense that, you know, when I talk to people in school districts, they will often say, well, yeah, we've had a, like some cases, but we don't have anybody we think got it at school. And so I think, Getting better information on that, of course, is a lot of work because you've got a contact trace and a lot of these districts are re like really limited in their ability to do that. But I think that's the biggest data blind spot in the whole space, not just with our dashboard, but just in general with our, our knowledge around schools and the pandemic. Right. I mean, a student and a teacher could each have independently gotten COVID going out to a restaurant or at a friend's house and then both happen to come to school on the same day with COVID. It doesn't mean they gave it to each other or got it at school. Right. And it's, it's sort of beyond that, like in the data from New York, at least sort of one of the early waves in the, um, you know, 80 percent of the schools had zero cases of the schools with a case. 60 percent of them had only one. So in a sense, you would sort of say, well, the, like, they can't really. It seems very unlikely they got it at school. It's literally one person. It's not even like an like an outbreak. And so that's a lot of these, these things are single cases within a within a school. But still, we're sort of reporting that out as a as a school affiliated case because, of course, it is a school affiliated case. It's just probably not a case that was acquired at school. You know, you're you're an economist, and you've taken on this like essentially like an epidemiology project. What what's your sort of background with doing? original data collection like this? I mean, as an economist, I'm a person who, who works with data. And so I've done, you know, data collection projects around health economics. I've done data collection projects around education questions in other countries around school enrollment. So I've done sort of data collection projects. I've done a lot of work with, um, with statistics um, and thinking about statistics. Um, but, you know, this has been like, um, this is, has been a sort of different space for me than my, um, than it's certainly a diff slightly different space than my, than my academic work. Um, it is pulled much more on my kind of public, uh, the sort of more public work that I do around parenting and, and pregnancy. Did you ever think about reaching out to public health officials or like government agencies to help coordinate the data collection? Absolutely. I had some early conversations with the CDC. I have like continued to try to get, um, you know, we've, we tried to get the Department of Education interested in doing this. Um, you know, and I think that there wasn't um, there wasn't really interest in doing this at those levels. Did they tell you what their rationale was for that? I think Betsy DeVos said very publicly um, in a webinar that she didn't feel that it was the job of the Department of Education to do this. And she thought it was the job of of somebody else, um, I think notably the CDC. I think the CDC has some, done some um, information gathering around schools, but kind of didn't feel that I, I'm, I wouldn't put words in their mouth. I don't know quite, I don't know, I don't know why this did not rise to something that they were doing. I'm asking about this in large part because recently the CDC cited your tracker as evidence that kids aren't catching COVID in schools. And I think you were, you were pretty amazed by that. And you were quoted as saying, it's totally bananas. I think we're doing as good a job as we can. This is not my field. It's crazy. Yeah, I, I was disappointed with that quote um, because I think it was taken a bit out of context. Um, so, you know, I think what, what I was asked um, was, 
you know, do, do I think that it is uh, a good idea for um, my team to be the people who are responsible for the data collection on America's schools? Um, and I, I don't think, I mean, I think that that suggests a failure of federal leadership. I do think that this should have been something the CDC should have been doing. It feels very important to me um, and probably not something that should be left to a team of volunteers. Um, you know, I do think our data, it may be the best data out there. So I guess in that sense, I'm not that surprised that it is some of the data that CDC is, um, is, is looking to. Um, I was a little disappointed that she quoted me as saying that's not my field when what I meant was I am not an education economist, which is a sort of like very esoteric way to, anyway, I learned some things about interviewing from that interview. So one, one learns, but, but, you know, I think I, but I think the, the sentiment of, you know, this is, this is an important enough thing that it should have been something that, uh, that, you know, leadership should have been willing to take on. I think that's, that's a point that's certainly true. How would you hope that the CDC would use your dashboard? It, it says on the website that the goal of the effort is to provide educational leaders and policymakers with information on how schools are reopening and what factors contribute to safe reopening. So in an ideal world, what were you hoping that an organization like the CDC would take from your work? I think we would like them to sort of uh, to learn something about variations across um, across space, to learn something about about mitigation, um, and maybe to I, like honestly to learn something about the value of data. So I think one of the things that has been has been helpful here, I think even to some states, is to sort of point in the direction of okay, this is the kind of information that you could be collecting, and I think that we have had some influence. Uh, in at least how some other, how some individual state governments have started thinking about data that they could produce and data that they could collect on their, uh, on their schools, because I think in some cases they, you know, there wasn't a clear plan at the state level either. And I, you know, I think, look, I think to, to take this as a piece of a lot of consistent with a lot of other data that schools are not very high risk environments, I am comfortable. I am comfortable with that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask, back in early October, you wrote a piece in The Atlantic called Schools Aren't Super Spreaders. Um, and, th you know, that article heavily leans on the dashboard to support yeah. you making that case. I think that I'm, I is, I'm trying to draw a distinction between the, between the statement of, you know, this is the best data we have. And if the CDC needs to make some recommendations based on the best data we have, then they should use these data because it is the best data that we have. And what it shows, consistent with also, I think, a lot of lived experience is that schools are not sources of significant spread. A separate point is, would it be better if we had better data? For example, data that did better contact tracing. For example, data from more geographic areas where we could see more details about how does this look in very low prevalence areas? How does it look in very high prevalence areas? Would it be better if we had data from North Dakota so we could see what happens you know, when the case rates are really, really high? Yes, that would be, that would be better. And the CDC was, I think, in a position to potentially do that kind of data collection much more so than we were because they are a federal agency with, uh, you know, the kind of levers that a federal agency has. And so I think I would draw a distinction between should they have done something in advance and is it inappropriate to rely on the best data that they have now? I think it's reasonable to rely on the best data that, that, that they have, which is, I think, our data. It would be better if they had created their own data set, which I think might have had the opportunity to be better. So what does it say to you then that this tracker is not being run by a local or national public health department? I mean, I think that, that you know, there have been a lot of failures in the pandemic of particularly at the, at the federal level and a lot of places where uh, things would have gone better if we had had a different uh, kind of leadership, a kind of leadership that had taken the pandemic more seriously and been more guided by uh, more guided by science. Um, and so I think this is just one example of those failures. There are now a number of different types of trackers for various different COVID metrics, um, and many of them, like yours, are created by private entities rather than governmental agencies. What role do you see resources like this playing in our COVID response going forward? A question that I'm unsure about is I think that in the new administration, if they had it to do over, uh, they would do a better, they, there would be a better set of sort of built government trackers that would have started from the, from the beginning. Given where we are now, I, I am not sure what to anticipate being possible, you know, starting in January. So, you know, the new administration is going to come in at the end of January. Like there are going to be a lot of very immediate issues like vaccine distribution. 
um, which are probably more important than tracking. Um, or maybe equally important. All these things are important. Um, and so I'm not sure how, what the role is going to be of sort of like once we have these trackers produced by other people that are already produced and people are using them, it may make sense to continue to rely on them, at least in some cases, while the administration focuses on, you know, things that are sort of more immediate, like practical things. But I, we have to, I think we'll have to see. If you were advising the new administration, um, specifically on how to handle schools, I mean, what sort of tracking would you encourage them to be doing to get you know, kids back to school or make sure that schools are as safe as possible? So I think that the, the sort of basic stuff I would be focused on at this point is having them, you know, adhere to some di- like distancing guidelines, some things that are, you know, the basic mitigation, everybody wears a mask, all this kind of stuff. But then I would have them focus on schools tracking when there is a case doing good contact tracing and trying to figure out if it spread in schools and then trying to figure out uh, if it did, what the circumstances were that led to that. So I think like the biggest thing we're missing that schools, t- that schools say like I f- that they don't know is like what, what are the things we should not do? And we see some sort of suggestive things like, oh, there's a lot of when we see multiple cases, it's a lot of multiple different staff and maybe they all had lunch together. OK, so maybe the guidance from that is like shut down the faculty lounge. That is the kind of very concrete guidance that I think we could see coming out of an administration, but that's going to require better sort of contact tracing, paying attention. What are you hoping to do with your dashboard from here? Um, People always ask, like, how long are you hoping this will last? Well, I'm hoping that it will end. Um, (laughs) I'm hoping to shut it down. Um, So I think, you know, we are, I see the next um, few weeks even, and sort of through like February 1st as a kind of the the last of the decisions. So I think if places are not going to start opening by February, maybe mid-February, then they're probably not going to open during the school year. So I'm hoping that we can sort of pull together a little bit more of this kind of some of these useful mitigation strategy kind of data in the next month so places can start to to use that. And then I think we will continue to track. So one of the things we've done is for districts that are enrolled, we have these district specific dashboards, which they can you know, report out if they want. So sort of enhancing a little bit of, of transparency. Um, and the other thing is I'm hoping we can use some of what, uh, what we have learned from having these sort of continual conversations with, uh, with districts and states. I'm hoping we can use some of that to try to, um, try to help places think about you know, learning from each other's experiences. Um, and that's a little different from doing something literally with the dashboard, but more like using the platform of the dashboard to have learned some broader, um, some more broadly helpful guidelines. What's like sort of your biggest takeaway about COVID in schools based on what you've learned over the past months? I think that what I would say in sort of one sentence is uh, is that, you know, we can open schools safely with appropriate mitigation strategies, especially for younger children. Do you send your kids to school? Absolutely. Five days a week, full time in person. (laughs) It's the greatest thing that ever happened. (laughs) How old are your kids? Uh, They are five and nine. Well, Professor Oster, thank you so much for speaking with me. Thank you so much for talking to me. This is great. 